for the slides. I got requests for the video, and we had some trouble. The web download wasn't working for some people, and I posted it on Google Drive. That was the play one should have worked. The streaming one should have worked. And what it was, was an internal network. It's locked. But when I did it from home, it wasn't. I'm going to unpause it. Oh. Kick this up. The deck, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Gen Users actually is, is not me originally. A guy named Andrew Bear. He goes to A Bear or if you buy IRC channels or anything else. He's a long time Jenkins open source committer and um, has been very, very large Jenkins installations. He was in charge of Dig before Kevin Rose did what he did. Um, and he was at Cloudera for a long time. And about a year ago, not quite a year ago, he uh, went to um, uh, So he's actually at the mothership now. Um, about two months ago, they asked me if I'd be willing to present the slide deck because I'm always chilling. And I'm, every talk I give, I'm always talk, talk, telling people to go watch the YouTube videos. Is so they presented at the CD Summit um, that was here in Irving. So I just, uh, I just ripped the brain off, off of them, and uh, we're going to go through it. Um, as I do, this is a combination actually of Andrews, my, and other Cloudbees and, and other Jenkins people's advice and findings. Um, so it, it's in general. Um, there are obviously, if, you, if you're a specialized shop doing, like right now my client, I'm doing a lot of puppet work and we want to do puppet CI work. We a lot of that kind of specialized stuff in here, but at the end, if we have time, we want to talk about some of those things, I'd be happy to. In any case, who am I? For those of you who haven't met me before, um, somewhere, that's, I put our full company title on there so you can appreciate full time. But, what people were, uh, we're, I'm with the DevOps practice of professors. So we are a team of guys that uh, originally we were Momentum SI, uh, which was the consultancy out of Austin. We got acquired about a year ago now uh, by VMware, and um, we do software management, infrastructure, DevOps. Insert your definition of ops. We can probably do it um, on a consulting basis, and uh, we are hiring actually. That was my one sales pitch. If you are looking for a job in DevOps type work, especially if you have Publicans, Chef, Ansible, and, and or VMware technology trains, talk to me afterwards. Um, it's all my selling thing I'm going to do. Um, or my email and Twitter, if you want to get a hold of me later, that's the best two ways to do it. But I'm a software developer. I've been doing it for, give or take, 25 years, uh, mostly in the travel industry. DFW is kind of hard to be. Uh, everything from you know automated testing, architecture, virtual admin, uh, kind of jack of trades. Uh, six or seven years probably now have been kind of focused on build automation and um, what is being coined you know desk kind of things. But uh, uh, AI falls into that. I'm a, I'm a huge test first developer and uh, test driven developer proponent, and uh, CI kind of fits well. Advantage at many of the places I've been and uh, implement. Uh, I have done some Jenkins plugin committee, not a lot, mainly just scratching itches of my own. If I see a bug in a plugin, I've gone in, I've done a few commits, C2 plugin, um, a few other randoms. Uh, I've done some plugins probably that aren't in open source just because I didn't want to go vessel of, as a character trying to get something open source. So nothing, nothing worth it. Um, I've been active in the Jenkins community since around 2009. Um, back when it was called Jenkins. Uh, just about every Jenkins conference. I missed one year, and I'm probably going to miss this year, which is really a new million. Um, but if you've been to Jenkins, now it's Jenkins World. They're calling it you, you go. It's cheap, cheap it's, um, but it's one of those conferences that's uh, very high value. Uh, a lot of vendors trying to sell you stuff. They're there, but the, all the cloud bees developers end up going there, and you can see some of the or some of the cool things coming down the pipe. I'm getting way ahead of myself there. I'm a certified Jenkins platform engineer, which means I took the test, and uh, I'm certified for both open source and enterprise. So um, there's that. 
a VMware certification that doesn't really matter. But, you know. So this is uh, lessons learned from uh, they've worked on very large scale Jenkins instances over the years. Um, talking about Jenkins itself and plugins. Um, this is from what clubbies and those of us who have been around Jenkins in the real world, what we're seeing out there. So this is not going to be a glossy, you know, this is great. This is really, you know, what are we seeing out there? The hat we're going to go over maybe be valuable on every kind of Jenkins. They're very general. They're not going to be specific, like I said, um, to a certain kind of technology or uh, whatever. You should be able to apply these all over the place. Um, they're relevant for large instances, but you can still apply them to smaller instances. So if you've got a lot of small Jenkins servers, you can apply a lot of this stuff to it. But a will look at the information as they're scaled their Jenkins infrastructure. So a lot of see that. Um, it's just recommendations. So first is to make your app faster and restorable. If you're not using long-term stable release, leave it and go, go move because the bleeding edge Jenkins, well, it's great, isn't it? Um, thank you from the open source community. Thanks for being guinea pigs. And on your desktop or if you've got like a one-off servers for doing things and play it. Uh, if you want to see what's coming, or you're working a plug-in that needs something new, great. But production Jenkins server, no, that's that's crazy. Um, these trains are created every 12 weeks. Um, they <clears throat> up about about three times before the next one comes out with security patches, uh, fixes, things like that. Uh, yeah, so like I said, it allows you to avoid bleeding edge. Uh, go through some uh, quite a bit of automated acceptance testing and manual testing by the people. But as I understand it, Red Hat Red Hat was running a huge, huge set of thousands of projects, in it. and they were tired of the instability of the old open source version. So they started saying, "Hey, we start have a stable version so that we don't have to spap our time." In or this or that, and so expanded on that. Uh, Jenkins 2.0, you may have heard of if you're watching the Jenkins uh, blogs and uh, discussions. Uh, I have an LTS train soon. Uh, there's some summer. Uh, my foundation about Jenkins 2 when, when my client my uh, uh, clients ask is that it looks like it's going to be very nice, but I can't recommend it for production right now. Wouldn't be bad to look at it, starting with it now. But it's an LTS, and in fact, it's an LTS, you know, done. Uh, it's not, I'm not going to recommend it. But it's coming. But you need to be about upgrading your plugins. Um, it's a lot without being obvious. So you go into the uh, update screen and it says, hey, you got a new version. You go what's in that version because, you know, um, Backward compatibility, it says, can sometimes break. It often can break, and, and I just used to work together. We had one where, remember that we would upgrade everything at once, one time, and it all went sideways. Um, it's not fun. Uh, the, the classic example that uh, uh, Andrew always brings up is there is the extended email plugin, which apparently everybody uses. It's like common plugins out there. Uh, the recipient for settings changed a couple of years ago, and it broke backwards compatibility. With, was like, like up a creek. It broke everything. Um, so, yeah, so be conservative. Uh, um, uh, new features can be unstable and problematic in the wild. Um, only up upgrade a plugin if you really need to. Um, and test bed. So, ops, Jenkins server. Grows, it grows, and it, it, it's you know first under a guy's desk, and then it's in the server room, and then it's on a VM. Never think about the fact that this is now like a key part of their development you know, development system, and they're upgrading plugins, upgrading Jenkins right on the on that master. You really have to test one. 
have have somewhere that you can test your upgrades, new plugins, um, you can go live in the production. Um, set up jobs on that test that cover plugin usage and those those jobs you have. So that you're you're exercising the same things similar to what will happen in production. Um, if you can test it at scale, if you can drive the same number of builds through it that you're doing in production, that's great because then you'll know if, if you know there's some weird garbage collector problems with the new version or plugin. Um, uh, give significant changes a few days at least. Of build don't just you know test it three times and say oh it's good to go. And, you no, know, no, give it some time to bake. Uh, so, so not not on here, but be sad testing. So if you got uh, cases and projects that are supposed to do something when they fail, like if you're using the promote plugin to do something, or if you're using the um, uh, well, well, if your build times out, it'll act on it. Simulate those things. Have a job that sleeps for an hour, and and, and if you are trying out and see what it does, uh, don't just test that everything you know is going blue or green. Back your configuration, which is kind of obvious. Well, back up, right? Back up everything. Yes. Well. Um, there probably not many people do back up, and. and you can, it's, again, very easy as a Jenkins organically grows, you're, you, all of a sudden you get in the part where like, oh crap, if I lose my configs, what am I gonna do? So um, there's a lot of poss possible solutions to doing backup uh, within Jenkins. Made in backup plugin, which we got a uh, endorsement from the Vanco. Um, I like the thin backup plugin too. Uh, it's nice. Um, the, could you pull copies of Jenkins home? Um, and a small Jenkins server, eh, it's probably okay, but most of the time you've got a lot of build artifacts and or logs and or whatever else in there. Uh, it's be slow and it's gonna use a lot of disk. Um, really need backed up, and what thin backup does is it backs up your config files uh, without all the builds in them. Because builds, generally, you don't know that much about them. Um, you want them there for historical purposes, but if you're, Using your build history for any kind of business metrics, you really should be using something like Sonar or other external entity that, that's better at reporting on that kind of thing. An example, and uh, when I, I'll post a link to the slides, or if you want to remember, tiny URL, jam 4 backup This script that a Andrew wrote that he uses to do backups if he's not going to use the thin backup plugin or something else. He's basically, put them on either on a Cronora or you know, in Jenkins itself. It's, it uses Git to back up everything he wants without the things he doesn't, and then it shoots it off to a Git server or something like that. Do you do that with backup? You target the directory and initialize the and then have a cron job that actually commits and pushes it. So it's, it's, like I said, I like FinBack too for that reason. It's, 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 it's simple and, yeah, works good. Um, be careful, though, if you do on this last set, if you're doing jobs on your master, master, you can to do that. Um, a job on your master runs as the user, usually, and you can see things to yourself accidentally, like if you are RMRF with the wrong path, that your entire Jenkins can do it because it's Jenkins, right? Um, Oh, I, I've run into the past, if you've got a Jenkins server that's running on a NAS, uh, some kind of NAS storage, uh, NAS got, when, they, when you get that from your storage team, they'll give you snapshot backup. Because of the, 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 the trans nature of the stuff in your Jenkins home, those stuff start taking up a lot of space and they're kind of hidden from you. You don't know that it's taking up space. Uh, as you, you build the, there's a plugin that'll throw away old Builds, or I'm sorry, um, that's sad. But shots are keeping them around for you know 90 days, or whatever your your company policy is. You might ask your storage guys to turn snapshotting off, off in the directory, or at least in the jobs directory, um, because it becomes one of those things. I remember getting called while I was working from Chicago by the Dallas I worked with. with the like, yeah, no. what do you mean the drive one? It's like it's not, it's got hardly anything in it. It's, 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 Oh, shoot, there it is. Um, the fin job type, when using Hudson and Jenkins, Jenkins obviously, 
job type was going to be the best thing in the world because it knows exactly what a Maven palm structure is and it can track all the transitive other effects and, use, and yeah, no. Um, it's not the freestyle builds Maven build step. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you say make a new job and one of them is Maven 2 job type. Um, it's kind of a redheaded stepchild of the Jenkins world. It's there because it always has been, and it's kind of hard, hard to remove because people do use it. But um, Andrew says here is questionable. Job type has built in support for the plugin. Well, that's about the only thing we use. We should put that afterwards because I don't think that's true anymore. But um, there's an employee. <laughs> but yes, but um, different kind of build. If you know anything about the Jenkins code, if you write plugins don't support it as well as the freestyle build, they, it, it starts acting wonky. And you can get there have been always been upstream downstream between freestyle and Maven build issues that crop up. Um, a lot of strange edge cases that show scale as well. Um, so if you keep an eye on your jobs and make sure that. If you're upgrading plugins, test those jobs out. But what I've found is that the Maven build step in a freestyle plugin does everything I need. I, I'm not using anything else. I'm thinking kind of um, repository deployments. The free plugin is incredible. It's great. It works great. The next plugin is works. Um, but they, I'll end up just doing a Maven deploy file or a Maven deploy if I need to. And, and it, developers understand that. They know the main command set and they know the Maven deploy plugin. So they can see that. Well, I see what you're doing, and I don't have a problem with it. But just be warned. Break quote, habit number two. Multi -master. If you have a lot of projects and teams, multi masters give you a lot more agility and control. So if you have one big master for your entire company, you to upgrade because you're stopping everybody hard to install plugins because when you do it, you could be breaking everybody. Again, you should have your test beds, but still, those kinds of activities are interesting to a lot of teams. Not to um, it may be, the smaller your Jenkins server is, as you know, it's a read at startup time. So those XML files that get after a while, it's using them to parse all that stuff in as it comes up, and the more it is the, law, the slower that takes. Even with the lazy loading they've been added in the last couple of years, it's so fast you can break things up. And a lot of different ways to break it up it depends on what works for your teams. But let's do it by organization, like funnel team. So you've got a, a team that works on the website, you've got a team that works on backends, you've got a team that works on the database layer or whatever. You have separate servers for those, it, it, you know, whatever. Um, some use Jenkins for in deployments and whatnot, we'll have a separate deployment in Jenkins and use remote job trigger plugin to trigger it. Sometimes we'll do that like a QA will have their own Jenkins server so they don't have to worry about the developer one being bogged down. All certain ways to cut that, but um, as I said, more math, um, more math is less stress on the masters. Ends up being, um, and less prone to any edge case scaling issues that are any bugs that you would, you would see otherwise. Um, as an enterprise customer, uh, it's a lot easier because they have clustering and um, slayering between masters. Um, it's not an open source thing, so it's not really in this deck, but FYI. Or transform your jobs. So modularization and reuse are good in programming. They're good in Jenkins, too. Multi-job builds allow reusability of generic jobs across multiple projects, releases, and whatnot. And, um, Pipeline plugins, which formerly one of the workflow plugins, uh, don't break your jobs, but they do the same thing in that they allow things to be grouped in a way that gives you the same benefit, um, make it more durable, um, understandable. Um, example, just at my current client, I'm doing puppet work where uh, um, we're using puppet to deploy applications as well as infrastructure. And one of the things we want to allow people to do is when they have a jar or war to a Nexus or Artifactory server, uh, we want our M collective to go out 
and run the puppet agent. Well, we everybody access to our puppet master and to get in there and type commands and you know but so Jenkins' job that does that and we from all that use it, we just trigger it and can trigger it from there. I was using the remote trigger plugin, things like that. Um, that's a generic chunk of code now that we can use like an object all over the place. And if we change it, say, oh, we need to add a filter to that BIM collective filter list. Right there, and everybody gets it. Uh, let's see. They're making up their jobs. Uh, there's a ton of ways to do it. These are just some examples. Uh, the kind, kind of uh, uh, everyone usually goes to is using the parameterized trigger, build trigger. Everyone knows what that is, I'm assuming. Plugin well, allows you to trigger the jobs with parameters that are programmable. Additional build steps are awesome. Um, most, a lot of times those things are used in conjunction. Uh, you have a job that triggers another and conditions that based on what it was triggered with. Two things. In fact, uh, if you are using Jenkins' internal artifact archiving, this will allow you to um, grab artifacts from your upstream job that triggered them, among other things. Builds is a pretty powerful tool as well. It allows you to act on things after the build is already finished. Uh, it can track in, in certain criteria. There are other things to happen, manual push buttons. Uh, uh, it's easy to configure this kind of a setup. Uh, very simple, though. You can pretty much do anything with this collection. Uh, as far as job triggers, job triggers, job triggers, 80 jobs triggers, job, you know, all this stuff. It's it's kind of easy to keep track of, but it's the most flexible of all of the ways to do it. Pipeline plugins, again, snap into a DSL. If, you, if you've been to the prior meetings, you might have seen when Kosuke was here, he talked quite the Jenkins file DSL. Um, it allows your relationships. Uh, instead in that DSL. Um, I is fairly new to this deck. If you watch Andrew, it's new. It's new since he's given. And Andrew and I are both kind of hesitant to tell you to use the pipeline plugins because they are pretty new. new. But you can use them on 1.x Jenkins. You don't have to go to the two. And um, I've seen it done yet at a large place, although I've heard it has been. I've not heard names of places it has been. Just so that with a little grain of salt. Um, it looks really cool. to be somewhere that gets to use it. Um, anyway, you can do all sorts of things with, the, with this pipe DSL. You can spawn off other slave nodes without have jobs that are labeled to nodes. They actually choose it in the DSL language. Uh, for multiple repositories, which is always a pain in, in main Jenkins. You have to have a plug that, and it's configuration floats so a huge. And we'll talk more about that later. So things, tasks as code. There's a lot to do in Jenkins as an admin. You do like, oh, go rename a bunch of jobs, or I've got to go clean builds of projects the developers made that they I, w I wasn't keeping track of. Um, the script console. Who's used the script console? The console allows you to run groovy code inside the Jenkins VM in full access to that of, of Jenkins. Um, it's a powerful tool. It's a very dangerous tool. Um, but you get full visibility of everything that's happening inside of Jenkins um, across the Jenkins object model. So if you're in the Java code that makes up Jenkins, if it's in code, you can get at it. Because that it's running in the JVM, um, you change the jobs. You can find problematic configurations by doing regex against it or something. Uh, more simpler library of such scripts that are commonly used ones. Um, uh, that there's with a big list of them, and there's a plugin for Jenkins that will read them in, and you can just say, "Oh, run that one." Um, common one I used to see that at the place Jeff and I worked was. Based developments. We had a trunk set of jobs, maybe a dozen or something. And then when we branch release, we would replicate those into a release set of jobs that were identical except for the branch name. Well, when this was you know, done and we were going to get rid of it, we didn't need it right away because if we had to roll back to it, we kind of want to keep it around. So I'd 
want to disable all those jobs because I really don't want them building the, the, the lockdown. We're not worried about it. So there's a scripter script to do just about that. You say a job that matches this naming pattern and disable it. And in seconds, it's done. Instead of what I used to do back in the day, I'd open the list of jobs and then I'd open a tab, 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 tab control T, configure, 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 and go through all the tabs. You come to the file system and do it and then bounce Jenkins, but you're you're taking Jenkins down. So not not fun with your team. Some examples of scriptler catalogs. Uh disable jobs, so I just talked about that. Uh build queue. So say something has happened overnight, your Jenkins server is 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 on our fetal edition. Um you want you've got a bunch of jobs queued up that you don't want to run anymore. No purpose for these to run. This scriptlet will go just execute like immediately. You don't have to buy Jenkins. This is, of course, saying that your Jenkins is still the same. Uh, set log rotation and discard all builds and configuration across all jobs. So let's say you've got a um, bunch of jobs that uh, you didn't realize how big the logs were on these things, and, and they're, they're easy. A lot of on disk. What you do with the log rotation plugin and this scripter is it'll go out and you can say, okay, I want to throw away any job older than X. I want all these jobs over here that I'm specifying to do that. And then log, what, you, when you set that initially, it doesn't do anything. The next build causes that to happen. The log causes it without a build having to happen. So it kind of combines that together and says, okay, well, I want to set all of them and then run, run log rotator on all of them. And it'll go all up in one shot. Uh, so I see him pulling a nut across all jobs. I've never had to do that, but apparently he did, and other people have had to do that. Um, run the rotator that kind of goes with the other one. Um, additionally, there is a plugin that allows you the, the system Groovy build step plugin that allows Groovy scripts as part of your actual. This gives the build full access to your Jenkins. So just give it to anybody. Don't 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 need to use this. But yeah, it allows you to take the thing you're automating and put it into a project, and then run that project when you need to. Just make sure you put matrix security on that so that only you run that project or your team if it's at all dangerous. Um, and down your configuration. So that nobody can get in there and mess up configuration. Uh, but what's cool about this is it's a good way to pilot plugin concepts. So if you thought you wanted to write a plugin to do something, because it's a repetitive task you want to do, and it's like, oh, it'd be cool to have a plugin to do that. Well, try doing this. Just write a Groovy script that does the thing, put it and run it a few times, and use that as a build step in a couple places. And if you like, then you know, oh, this would be valuable as a plugin. So write a plugin. But, um, or if it's just something that's not worth the trouble of writing a plugin. This is a tool for that. Um, so for, oh, and you can script for script as the steps. Same same idea. Generation code. So the Jenkins, as many of you probably know, Jenkins is a REST API and a CLI. Um, and in fact, a lot of people use a CLI. I never use it, but a lot of people use it. If you go get certified for Jenkins, you better know it because I'm surprised how much I didn't know about the Jenkins CLI. Um, answers. Um, not only do things, you know, trigger jobs or whatever, it allows you to change jobs. You can pull the XML of a job down, mud it up, and then post it back just like you were a browser. Um, you find your whole job and or set of jobs in a DSL or in the translates configuration through job execution. Um, I have a guy in this room who wrote a job maintenance Project use a Python Jenkins library, I believe, to so get to externalize all the projects and keep them in a Git repo, and then they could just run the script and would create all the jobs they need in an, in an own way um, outside of Jenkins completely. So to do that, there this guys wrote the job DSL plugin. It provides a full Groovy DSL for writing job definitions. You 
in that code and you have a job that creates jobs. So many of the plugins support this. There's a lot of plugin support for this, um, but it allows you to just say, you know what, make sure all of my builds that match this you know, regex or whatever have this plugin configured this way and this plugin configured this way, whatever. And then if you need to change that, you change it, you check it into Git, that project wakes up because you checked into Git, it's, oh, it's time for me to make sure all of these jobs match this other sets. There's that .ci plugin. Actually, so this job, it represents the entire Jenkins model as well. You can pretty much do most everything. It's, it's pretty widely used. Uh, reading my notes and seeing if I missed anything on that. Um, does require a certain level of knowledge of plugins because you need to know how to get out of plugins and, and call the thing. So it's not as simple as you might think. It's, it just, it's, it's advanced. You have to a lot of readme's, dig into code. Um, it's about, so yeah, anyway. The dot plugin is a little simpler. What it is, I believe it's the YAML bit, yeah, YAML based uh, job definition, very similar to the job DSL, uh, the Jenkins file DSL, the slide plugins you can use. I wouldn't be surprised if in a year from now the slide deck changes just to say you know, Jenkins itself. But uh, it's a bit simpler than that. If you check in this YAML file that defines how you want your build to run, the, the plugin watches repos, and if it sees one with one of those YAML files, then it, it'll create a project based on that. And uh, um, you understand, not full. As much plugin capabilities. Um, yeah, so anyway, and pipeline plugin, which we've already talked about. Um, I'm going to go over that again. But it also is, fits into the pipeline as code. Which, honestly, the call back to the old days, you ever used you know, uh, cruise control, old CI servers, everything was checked in with the code, and it, it was kind of nice. It wasn't easy to support necessarily as the newer ways of things, but that way you know. You have control on all your your job configs. Um, it does mention multi-branch support for GitHub, which is to be made. So if you've not seen the pipeline multi-branch support, it's cool, and I recommend you go Google for Jess Glick's um, talk on it. It's um, a way for if you had, uh, Jenkins will watch and uh, you're during GitHub. I believe they're 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 going to extend it for others. But somebody makes a branch and it's got those Jenkins files in it. It'll actually create a new project for them to do see a branch. And when they pull request and come back into the main, it'll delete the branch or delete their projects. Well, optionally, you can turn that off. But, um, but the SCI for their work, and they can make make sure that my work merges them my upstream is good before I even open a pull request. So it's pretty nice. Pipeline adds durability, and again, these are new slides, so pipeline will pretty new, just be aware. But um, if your Jenkins starts, it can actually pick back up because it saves, it, it keeps its state. Uh, um, the visualization for pipeline, if you're on Jenkins 2, they have what is today enterprise plugin, but they've open sourced it for Jenkins 2, which gives you a view of all your stages and your pipelines and where you are and how long. Um, it's the classic pipeline view plugin, if you've seen it. It's, it's, it's a bit cleaner than that. And it's funky. You can actually have pauses in your pipeline waiting for manual input. So if you've got like a go to stage, you can say not till QA comes and says do it. You don't want to pull the rug out from under or anything like that. And you can tell the copies guys put this in. Pipeline is the direction Jenkins go on board. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and your plugins. Okay, this is the, probably the most my favorite part of this talk because I think this is the most important part. part. The plugins can be evil, as Grandpa says. Mr. Jenkins, there's too many plugins these days. Please eliminate 300. Yes, I'm not a crackpot. You really need that plugin? Do that. That's the ask yourself when you see this cool new plugin. Um, don't install them if you're not actually going to use them. First of all, if you, it just sounds good, uh, no, come up with a use case. Maybe you're going to do something on them. It's a duplication of functionality across plugins. So if you see this 
one thing that just, just does that one thing that's really cool. See if you don't already have a plugin that has something similar in it. Do a little jump on IRC, maybe ask around. Um, because there are, there's a lot of duplicate, duplicated effort in some of these plugins. I mean, there's, what, there's like 30 now? I don't even know how many of them are anymore. A thousand, and it was like mine blew up. Um, and cause instability in areas you don't expect. Um, and that's supposed to do this whole thing over there, and all of a sudden all these jobs over here start blowing up because it's doing something in the object model that is doing up garbage collection or doing whatever. Um, is most people don't think about with plugins is just about every build plugin adds XML to your build jobs. So as I said, when, when Jenkins is coming up, it's loading all of that XML in. If you add a plugin adds half of XML to any job that it sees, those now start it adds, especially if you've got a very big install with hundreds of projects. Um, so just be this in what you to um, or make sure there's a specific value you're trying to get out of that plugin. Um, make sure you try it in your test environment. Don't just on your production one go to launch. Make sure it's stable. Go look at the commit history in, in, in GitHub. Look at issues in GitHub. Um, it's open source. It's, it's an open book. Um, if you were thinking about writing a plugin, Go see if there's a plugin that already does it. There's some plugins out there. It's very good. There's one that already does it. Um, I want to ask, when you remove the plugin, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to remove the plugin that it cleans up. Yes. I'm that. Oh. <laughs> but yes, that's a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, hold for 30 seconds. Um, the only thing about plugins is. is If there's something similar to what you want, white, and you're thinking I'm writing a new plugin to do what I want, extend the plugin that already exists that's close to it. I um, think at our former, my former employer with Jeff, uh, being, uh, uh, you see a timestamp for plugin, right? You might see the timestamp, it timestamps on your logs. Well, I have a, a libraries plugin because I want to be able to have link, linkable anchors and be able to say line number X. I wrote a new plugin. On the timestamp, or a plug. You don't need this because I immediately slapped myself in the head, so I should have just updated the timestamp or plugin to have that as an option because it would present the same code. Matter. Um, clean their data. <laughs> so when, when you've got a plugin that you've determined is not needed or used anymore, get rid of it, uninstall it. Um, do that, go check your managed Jenkins page because you'll see a little banner at the top often. And this for plugin upgrades too. The way that there is old data, do you want me to clean it out? On your server. Do that. Make sure everything's working. And go over and do it on your production one if everything is still the same. On your job and build config files and all, all that stuff. Um, but you should, should remove plugins. Um, and it is stable as I can imagine. It, it goes in and it marks a plugin as. It changes another file and, and takes it on the next reboot. It'll completely remove it, I believe. Um, speeds of loading the master individual jobs are the same reasons. So plugins. These are the plugins generally that Andrew and, and other people see used there that I almost always install. Um, not counting edge cases like you know if you're doing VMware stuff or, or public stuff. But job history is I say. If you've got one, what it does is every time Jeff can change his config, or Cruz can change his config, on the build history, the next build that ha happens will get a little gear, I think it is, icon. This, this job happened after a config change happened. Now, it's for the next build to show you that, but, but it has another link up there that will take you to the build, the job config history. It will list out these are when the things ha happened. Does it change? Yeah, so it's when you change the config all the way back, and you can diff them. Now, diffing XML, but it's pretty easy. Usually, it's a small enough change. You can see you get what you're doing. And you can reset back. You can revert. Um, great plugin.
we do all like the disk usage plugin, and but not anymore. Um, it's a, if you don't know what it is, it's a plugin that goes out and scans um, how much disk space is being used, jobs, how the workspace for this, this job, after, you know, and over time. The problem is, as I understand it, I stopped using it because I, I was seeing threads for this thing out there waking up and, and eating CPU like crazy. It's going out there and it's, it's just hammering I/O to read all this stuff up. It's the, and I'm guessing it's doing the equivalent of a DU on all these threads all the time. Live when the bill happening. It's like after the fact it gets notified, hey, sometime soon, go check that. Or wait for something. Anyway, so yeah, pretty much everyone says it's not, you just don't use it. It's not, it doesn't handle big installations well. The process plugins, this is the group of plugins. Uh, if you're a job, you've got TME, check style, various thing kind of plugins like that. Um, there because they help your team understand the quality of their code over time. So you can see how, what's the cyclical complexity over time if you're doing code coverage plugins. You can see how many PMD violations are we doing over time, are we getting worse. And you can ratchet your builds. So you can say, you know what, we'll handle this level. We're, right now we're at this level of, of violations of our code standards. No harm. And every time the build gets better, because people clean the code up, it'll ratchet that down. But he checks something in that makes it worse, it breaks the build. So it, it kind of pushes things down. Uh, so JUnit, you know, we know we can, if you run Java and you use JUnit, or it outputs JUnit, that's that report on The unit plugin takes many different kinds of test tools. Uh, and we'll, we'll turn their output into JUnit compatible, so Jenkins can read, read it natively. Um, I do most Java work, so I don't do much, but I've seen it used quite a bit. I think I used it for Ruby stuff, for the group, whatever. Parameter trigger and conditional build step. There's a Swiss Army knife for build workflows. We talked about them earlier. Uh, I think they should be built into the for the plugins, honestly. Stamper also, um, I think, should be built in. Uh, it's really good. One thing I love about Timestamp, it's a simple plugin, but you've got a job that takes 10 minutes to build. It's always 10 minutes, and all of a sudden, it's 30. If you've got a plugin turn, you know, installed, you can look through the build log, and view, you can view it in a different, couple different ways, but you can see elapsed time as it's going, and you can see what took forever, because it will go, you know, one minute, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, ten minutes. So what the heck is that? And you can look at the, it, you know, what change that caused that to take forever. It could be an external dependency, but it often is a, somebody putting a J in it. Um, <laughs> yes, that happened. <laughs> what happened? I went by bottlenecks. Um, so it eases collaboration on build issues because if you're seeing it, it you can say, hey, hey job developer. Look at that. what the heck did you do? So, inject. This one's kind of contentious. Uh, there are people who say that it, it's not as stable as it used to be. I've got a problem with it. It's a nice way of in, in, injecting environment variables into your job's workspace, cross build steps. If you need to do Java homes, that's something funky for some reason. You can with this plugin, and then every build step you have after that will have that environment set to what you want it to be set to. Um, and it's a lot, but when you need it, it's it's kind of nice. Re is a godsend if you have parameterized builds. If you got a parameterized build that had eight or ten parameters, and it was measured by another job or something, and it failed for you know the reason something so like a server was down that was trying to talk to, and I rerun on that build. Well, I don't want to have to sit there and, and, and all of this, you know, it's always open a tab, open a tab, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And you just hit rebuild, and it'll fill in all the parameters, and you can them if you want to change them, but, and, and go. You don't have to do that. It's cool. Nice plugin. Build plugin is nice if you've got long-running builds um, and you want to do something if they hang. It's allowed to do that. Take um, my word for it. 
today, and Andrew and all our, our favorite plugins. You might not need them. You might need others. There may be other ones you really like. Uh, very versatile. Um, they have a lot of value with very little risk. Also, don't forget with plugins to check your global configuration. Because plugins, um, global configuration needs in the master, you know, the, the big configuration, not the job, job one. Um, they don't always work for you, and sometimes the defaults are not great choices. For instance, the job config history plugin by default saves changes for every Maven module separately. So if you're using Maven build, which is the talked about up front. Once that build happened, it actually breaks the project up into the Maven sub-projects that make up the build. Runs them as like kind of little ephemeral projects as, as it goes. Change the project that's you know, the actual project. And is on the box. It actually will see all of those little sub-projects for every little Maven module, and it'll track the changes across all of them, even though the change is identical for, for all of them. That's fine. You can turn that off. So you should. But it's a good idea. You check the plugin. Make sure if it added global bits, go jump. Make sure that the properties look valuable. At the time of the wiki page will tell you that. It will tell you what it's going to offer. Let's see. 756. Okay. Uh, integrate with other tools and services. So Jenkins plays nicely with others. We, we all probably know this. Uh, it has a REST API, so other tools can interact with it too. Um, your builds based on GitHub pull requests, uh, uh, update your upon successful builds, and all sorts of stuff you can you know what uh, Apple Jenkins is. is. I'm going to teach you a lot more if you go out and look at the Jenkins wiki, but these are kind of the ones that everyone likes. Source well, yay, of course, if the CI server it better do that. Um, there are more control plugins than I. GitHub pull requests. So, uh, Garrett, if you're not familiar, that's an open source code review tool. It's very popular like Android community for all of their stuff. Um, that the Garrett trigger, GitHub pull request builder, pipeline multi branch kit, these are all very useful triggers that different states in your, your Git repositories, it'll trigger the jobs to, to, to run. Uh, pull request builder is really nice because if you've got a project that uh, Flow style, you know, ramp to your change, pull requests to come back in or fork off, it, whichever. Uh, the request builder will actually reach out to Jenkins, say, hey, he wants to bring this back in, and it's like a reviewer. Of, so it'll report back in the GitHub comment list for a colored block that says, I'm doing this right now over at this link, Jenkins project. You might want to wait to, to accept this pull request. If it fails, it'll go red and say, he's reviewed this. Fail. If it goes good, it'll go green and say, I'm probably good. Um, more than that, but that's that's kind of the, the, the kind of use case. The um, multi pipe support takes a step further because we use that nice, except that your build, so you've got, say, let's say this is a master type of a build. You've got build number one, two, three, four, these are all the things that have come into master. And so, pull request, it builds the pull request online. So, you've got Build of master, build of master, build of merged pull request. For what I build of master, and you could it's really not it's not sequential anymore. You kind of jump and seeing things in line. The multi-branch pipeline plugin fixes that. But like I told you, it creates a separate project for the branch that the pull request is going to be on. So they litter up your build history with their changes. Um, and I believe. Even, don't quote me on this, but I believe it actually does the same kind of reporting back to GitHub to let you know that it, it's been built. I have to check on that. It does. Jenkins file now. Does it? Cool. Well, yeah. The, the yeah as soon as you merge your project, you have the Jenkins file in it, mm -hmm. and you have filter turned on for whatever branch you mm -hmm. it'll create the project. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so these things basically come back to the code tools have a robotic review for the these Jenkins. I've seen gear set up where you can't merge a Jenkins that you pass it. So it works with a plus minus type of a system. So lots will have everybody has a has a one vote and your leads have a two. And if it's, I have to get a plus two to get 
the other two to merge. You can you know, say go, but normal developers, you got to get the two of them to vote for you. Well, you can also say and Jenkins, so lead can override a broken bill. Um, so it's kind of a cool plug. Uh, you can update Jira issues with commits. So this is a big common. A lot of places use this, where you review Jira ticket for every commit coming into the world. You developer includes the Jira ticket code, you know, ABC-123, whatever it is, in the commit comment. This can sees that and goes out to the Jira server, opens that ticket and comments that, hey, ticket was involved in this build, FYI. You can customize that to say only update them if the build passes, do things like that. Um, Following your friends to update issues and related projects as well. I've never done that, um, so I can't really speak to that. And Jira release notes. I've also not done that, but I've I've heard that's pretty cool. So looking up. Sorry. Our, the factory integration, as I said, the plugin from Artifactory that JFrog guys wrote is really nice. Um, basically, define credentials for deployment and artifact resolution globally across all your Jenkins jobs, and then you just use that as a as a um, override Maven distribution management on a per job basis, so you don't have to worry about changing palm files just for your CI server. Uh, restrict where maps and build steps will look to resolve artifacts and um, capture the info and artifacts artifactory, so it stores some metadata in the artifactory server about where things came from. Went out. Docker, everyone loves Docker. Um, I love Docker. You love Docker. Everybody loves Docker. Um, the Jenkins Docker plugins are pretty cool, um, and I'm sure Cloud used to send us somebody to, to actually talk about them, that's a developer on them. Um, you know, otherwise, one of us will have to do it. But um, you can build their images with the, with the Docker Image Builder plugin. Uh, you can run your build in Docker containers. That's very cool because it's in good state always, and it, it starts up instantly. It's like a, it's like or vSphere plugin to start up a slave on demand, but it's like instantly. No need for warm up time or anything. Um, and you know it's in a good state because it's a container and it's an image. Uh, so you have containers. So let's say uh, you have a container uh, built over here. It gets used by a functional test over here. The same Jenkins fingerprint that happens on artifacts, if you've not seen that, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, have Docker containers. It uses Docker image hash. And ah, the image that the Docker image I built over here got used over there. And if it failed, it came from over here. Cross reference things very well. That's the thing in Jenkins, honestly. If you have any artifact in Jenkins, you track its usage throughout the system or other systems. Turn on artifact fingerprinting. Um, if you're having artifacts in Jenkins, it automatically fingerprints them. But it'll have an MD5 hash of the artifact. And if anywhere else that's watching for that artifact, uh, on a job that included it, you can click see the fingerprints, show the I think it's the link, and do every job that ran that included that thing. So if you've got a build that triggers a smoke test, that triggers a functional test, that triggers a deployment to something, you build, test, 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 and the state of the tests, all from the, from the top level build. Um, and it has full pipeline integration, the Docker stuff does. Okay, so almost there. Make slaves fungible, that's a fun word. What does it mean? Uh, it's a property, a good or commodity, whose individual units are capable of mutual substitution, generic. You, you know, make yourself usable by just everything. Um, one is a slave, you can replace easily with another slave. One is, I don't care, it's cattle, make another one. Um, I need 10 more. I've got virtual machines or Docker containers that I can just make more. And I need to do a whole bunch of hand wringing and man manipulation to get this thing ready to go. Um, just your life might be easier. How do you use configuration management? It's a great way to do it. So if you use Puppet, Chef, Ants, well, I don't care, whatever, one of those kinds of tools, uh, as the VM comes up, Ansible or whatever can say, put the things on there that I know my company needs. Do that, and then it's right. Pre for Docker, 
uh, AIs in the cloud, templates in vSphere, whatever. C boot, come up for how you do it. The idea is have to come up and be ready to go without having to worry about, well, I use this slave for these builds, I use this slave for those builds. I mean, sometimes you got that. You got Windows versus you got OSical machines over here. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you got 18 different Java projects. One day type should be able to build all of those things. Um, also use Packer to make these pre-built images. If you've ever seen they HasherCorp guys, they think called Packer, which allows you to define uh, a machine image in any code. So you actually have a job that builds it up and says, okay, it's ready. Puts it in your repository to use. Uh, again, I don't care what configuration man. I, I'm not religious about configuration management. I like Ansible personally, but whatever. I'm public work right now with my current client. Um, not just, but it's fine. Whatever. So I, mean, I don't see a engine. Them generally it's reusable, flexible. So it's solely for use by one job, if you can avoid it. Usable slaves allows, allows for more efficient usage. It's very true. So if you've got 20 slaves available at any one time, only three of them can run builds because DBs install these or whatever, or three slaves. Right? If you can mix and match, now, there's ways to say, don't ever let my last build go to a test job. You can, you can use your labels to kind of demand that. But if you've got nice, you know, virtualized slaves that can start up pretty quickly, you don't care. You use the cloud to spike or use your Docker containers or whatever. If you need specific custom saves, slaves, make them on demand so they're not tying up resources that other slaves could be using. So if you've got a, a private cloud or even AWS, you don't want to be paying for or letting a custom Snowflake slave use up all the memory or CPU on a box when it's not doing anything. You can set uh, Jenkins up to shut it down when it's been idle for a while. So you're, you know, not doing that. And the cloud is a great way to do this. Um, again, you've got, it lets you. Uh, so you have maybe private stuff for your your level of need and then spike your cloud and then come back. Paying for resources you don't need to pay for when you're not using them. Private uh, VMware or Simple Cloud Foundry or whatever work for this. Uh, public AWS, Azure, um, VMware, vCloud Air, Docker, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, title resources can. Free bay images like we talked about before. Um, this is actually a debate point. If you images, you got to manage those pre baked images. It can very quickly stand up a generic image and have Puppet or something make it be the way you want it to be. I like that because then you're managing a lot of little snowflake images now. If you have one image that can be used everywhere, just manage that because the, the speech you come up with is, is incredible. Join the community, get involved, write plugins, or better extend existing plugins. No plugin if you don't need to. Oh, tickets. Look at Fix bug. bug. Go to issues.jenkinsci.com, whatever. It's on the jenkins.ci page. Um, so if somebody else has opened that ticket already, you have, look at the state of it. If, you, if you've got developers that could, you know, choppers that could fix it, what open source is all about. Um, it, open a ticket. If uh, otherwise get help, mailing lists are great. I like the RSC a lot. Uh, you'll see an IRC often. Um, you can get to it again from the Jenkins homepage. There's a, a I think there's a, a change page just recently. I made it all pretty now. And I can't remember the links anymore, but it's like get involved or contribute or something and under the chat. And based IRC client you can get into, or you can use Textual on the Mac um, if you can get through the firewalls. Client or company. Um, get questions. No, most Jenkins developers honestly are on the West Coast. So it might be a while to get an answer. 
Um, and that's the early morning you get the European guy. <laughs> um, so there are quite a few copies guys in Europe. So they're often on there. And you know, if somebody has a question, you, you've seen it, you've seen that problem or had it. Nobody's going to come with that. Um, conference, it's worth it. And that is the whole thing. Um, I'm going to the recording and the